You know, I really don't think I have a lot of vengeance for this show. I really don't think so because this is one of the uh, this is one of the better shows of 2005, uh, according to a lot of people. You don't seem to think so. You don't uh, seem to think so. Uh, you know what? I watched this show live as a kid, and uh -huh. I was looking forward to reliving it. And to an extent, I did. Let's just say the main event on this show delivered, while the undercard under delivery. Can we mind? Not straight up, but we are back with another classic tape review with our retrospective. This time it's Vengeance 2005, the only pay-per-view in WWE history where the WWE Championship and the World Heavyweight Championship are on the line under a single brand pay-per-view. That's very yes. important to point out because we are in the middle of the draft, but this time it's a lot different than what we're used to. There yep. was no Tumblr. There were no general managers making their picks. This time the picks were made behind the scenes. And yep. the superstars would make surprise appearances. And the first and most important, most iconic one is when Chris Jericho had John Cena, the WWE champion from SmackDown, drafted over to Raw. I remember watching that moment live as a kid and going absolutely crazy for that. That was such I an, was, an important moment in history. I was dumbfounded, dude. I will never forget watching Raw live that night because I was so excited for the draft to get started. And I was like... Why is the WWE champion on Raw? This is so strange. But thinking about it now, with John Cena being Vince's new rock and Vince finding his new poster boy, he had to have John Cena on the A show. He couldn't have him on SmackDown. So it, it was, it's yeah. Yeah, it's very weird because we're in the midst of this draft. All the picks haven't been completed yet, so we're going to get some new stars on this show. Yes. But SmackDown may not. It's a very interesting concept um i feel like with draft standards you know we've been through so many versions of the draft we had the uh, initial one in 2002 where uh vince and rick flair made all of their picks and then you had um the the bischoff and Heyman one where they had the tumblers and they made their you know quote unquote random picks and then we have this one we're going to do that weird roulette one where wrestlers win matches for their brand and they get the picks that way <laughs> my personal favorite the superstar shakeup, and I hope Triple H yeah. kind of implements that back in because the draft has been a huge stinker the past few years. And I think a superstar shakeup where they just grab a handful of talent from each show and just swap makes a lot more sense than oh my god, Cody Rhodes is drafted to Raw even though he's been on Raw for the past two years. What a shot! Right? Man. Yeah, you know, yeah. like thinking back to this 2005 draft lottery, I can very easily compare this to the superstar shakeups of the mid 20 teens because, like you said, you have John Cena randomly showing up on Raw in a huge shocker, and then he gets into a rap battle with Christian in a feud that's been so well built up over these past number of months, and we'll get to that match. But you also have people like Kurt Angle showing up randomly just to confront Triple H and have a woo off with Ric Flair, and it's yeah, it's great. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. And I remember that was they that was Kurt's first Raw. night on Raw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember they had a match on Raw. It was Flair versus Angle for who would be the man. <laughs> what a weird, weird time 2005 was. An Olympic gold medalist versus the dirtiest player in the game. Yeah, it's uh, but <laughs> it's a weird mm -hmm. matchup. With this opening match, it kind of also shows, here's the thing. Yes. I just complimented the superstar shakeup, which is a Vince idea. Not every one of Vince's ideas was stupid. That was a good one. No. And I feel like this pay-per-view encapsulates how good of a booker Vince can be and how bad of a booker Vince can be. Yeah. So this match up. Well, you get, uh, excuse you, so you get a lot of fresh matchups with this draft lottery, and we'll talk more about it when we get to the Great American Bash up next, but this opening contest is for the Intercontinental Championship, my friend. It is the new champion, Carlito. Yes, Carlito, a brand new addition to Monday Night Raw. He is defending against the former champion, Shelton Benjamin, literally a match that was put together in a week. Like, because Shelton was the champion for a long time on this retro. And now Carlito comes in, and the whole gimmick is his first night on SmackDown, he wins the mid-card title on SmackDown from John Cena. His first night on Raw, he wins the mid-card title, ending Shelton Benjamin's long reign. So, it's it's interesting. And, it's interesting. Yeah, and I hate to bury the lead now. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. This single move right here flatlines Shelton Benjamin's career. 
Yep. Like, this was the beginning of the end for him. We spent the past year praising Benjamin. He got that big win against Triple H on Monday Night Raw when he first got drafted over. He beat Ric Flair on pay-per-view. He won the Intercontinental Championship in amazing fashion at Taboo Tuesday. And he was such a good champion on Raw. But there were two factors, I feel like, went into the downfall. Well, three factors. Number one, this move. Vince just loved slapping the title on a guy night one with zero build and having this token rematch on the pay-per-view. Number yeah. two, Shelton Benjamin had an unfortunate botch, I want to say, during that Intercontinental Championship match, where yeah. he went to go leap over the top rope. He went for a springboard, and he just slipped. He yeah. completely slipped. He ate shit. And I feel like the minute that happened, Vince was just like, my new toy is broken. This toy is broken. I don't want it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't do shit after this. And it's very well sad. It's not like he's a complete non-factor on the roster because he's still there for another couple of years or so. He becomes the gold standard a few years after this, which is a humongous breath of fresh air for him, in my opinion. But he doesn't really a do full years. He yeah, until 2010. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't do anything really. Like he never becomes the world champion, like Jr. actually predicted a year ago. But. I mean, here he is challenging for a title that he held for 244 days. It's a long intercontinental title reign for that uh, for that era, yeah. I guess you can and say. And again, it's just Vince's lack of wanting to use Benjamin after this moment. And I feel like after this match, it kind of becomes a theme for Benjamin where he just fucks up. He starts botching. I remember infamously, he teams up with the Big Show. He immediately runs down and he tries to jump off the steel steps to mm -hmm. land on an opponent and he slips there and it's like yeah he, benjamin botched but vince looked at that and said nope he's damaged goods and it's a damn shame they're playing up the fact that shelton is going into this match with a concussion whereas in today's wwe shelton would not have been cleared to compete but i mean again it's also a case of vince loving him some carlito and who can fucking blame him? Because Carlito is awesome. But, I mean, you go in... Yeah, fuck off. But, you know, you go into this match and... You know what? I mean, it definitely could have been better. But I don't think that's a knock on the wrestler's talent. Because I think both of these guys are very talented. It's just a lack of build, lack of heat, and a weird-ass angle with Shelton Benjamin being the botch master now. And basically, you know, going into this match concussed. It was... I don't know. I, I mean, the crowd yeah. got the crowd got into it. The crowd in Las Vegas definitely got into it. Oh, oh my God. Okay, before I forget, I'm sorry. The pay-per-view takes place in Las Vegas, and I'm sorry. I hate this entrance stage. I really do, because do? it doesn't scream vengeance. It screams, hey, we're in Las Vegas. Here yeah. we are, you know? <laughs> like, but I did appreciate, and I like this. I feel like this they do more WrestleMania more now than anything, but I do like the match graphics being on the Titan Tron while the yeah. match is happening. Mm -hmm. I think that's a nice touch. On a but, on a pair I mean, of uh on a pair of cards, no less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, this match is all right. Again, the, the the two people in this match are very competent. I feel like if given a lot more time and a lot more build and a lot more stability, they could have put on a banger match. But you know, this match was here, Benjamin. Still super athletic. I feel like Carlito is feeding off of him very well in this match. And not a fan of the ending because it makes Shelton Benjamin look like a gigantic goof. Yeah. There were a Maybe couple of goof. There were a couple of good near falls in here. Like Shelton hit a nice springboard bulldog, and the crowd really, really bought into that as the finish. Really, really good false finishes towards the finale of this match. Uh Shelton does his uh cool uh dragon whip kick at one point. He charges in with a stinger splash. Carlito moves out of the way. And there was a point where Carlito had exposed the uh, steel bolt on the turnbuckle. Benjamin and his concussion go, bam, face first into that turnbuckle. Carlito rolls up Shelton Benjamin and uh, has a handful of tights. It's Tomas's favorite finish on the planet, the roll-up. And uh, Carlito retains. Was there any doubt? He's only held the title for six days. Got to keep that reign yeah. going, right? It was a foregone conclusion. Also, the roll-up was Carlito's finisher. Carlito really didn't have a finisher. He had he was using that lame ass move that I hate. Uh the ozone slash the playmaker. Oh god, the, the overdrive. Yeah, <laughs> the overdrive. He was using that? Yeah, he, he was, was using I know I know he would rarely use it. 
I know rookie Orton used it, and I know MVP used it. Didn't know Carlito used it, though. I, he I, did for a hot minute. And man, again, it's going to be a few months. It's going to be until after WrestleMania, until the backstabber is no, wow. introduced. No uh, shit. Which is originally called the backcracker. Uh, yeah. But then once he uses it against a certain somebody, uh, he changes it to the backstabber. Well, also, I'll give Carlito that. He invented that move. And yeah. everybody uses it. Well, backstabber, um, that's kind of inappropriate for Carlos Colon's son, if you really think about that name. But anyway, uh, <laughs> two and uh, um, two and three quarter stars. I thought the match was serviceable enough. I mean, it's two competent workers. Again, nothing against either worker here. Carlito is not mid, and he's definitely continuing to prove that, in my opinion. But, I mean, <laughs> ah. this is the best it's going to get for him. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna give it two and a quarter. I just, it just, wow. It felt, it felt very flat for me. Um, it was a okay. decent match, but with very questionable booking, and I just can't shake that 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 thing that this is the bet the the end of the best for Shelton Benjamin as a singles wrestler. He's not gonna really do anything. He's gonna goof around on Raw. He is gonna turn <laughs> heel later on in the year, and we will get to that. Yes, uh, we'll get to that when we get to that. But this was a decent enough opener. Um, how how much did they get? Like twelve minutes? Um, d- dude, not even that. Like, oh wait, no, yeah, you're right. Twelve fifty. Yeah, no, fuck me. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think um, it's just the build, the build and the booking just really turned me off to this match. Yeah, I think I liked it more than you did because it didn't really feel like twelve minutes. It felt like a very breezy match to get through. It's a very easy match to sit through. I think it's a good choice for an opener, but again. Just not enough build, not enough heat. And I feel like if you had more build, if you drafted Carlito to Raw earlier, then you probably would have had a better match and the crowd probably would have been more into it. But yeah. I will give him credit for this next year at Taboo Tuesday. He's going to have an excellent match with the returning Jeff Hardy. And I, yes. I, I like that match a lot more uh, yeah. from what I remember. See, he's great. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> um, One yeah. match out of 100 doesn't make you good. So, um. Yeah, so this whole pay-per-view is built around Hell in a Cell, the final encounter between Batista and Triple H. And this is the point where you just kind of see Triple H arriving to the building with Ric Flair. Um, that'll be important when we uh, when we get to that. But up next, you know, women's division match, but fuck the women's title, I guess. Uh, yeah, this one's very weird. And I forgot about this feud until I rewatched the pay-per-view. And it just shows what a different time we're in when it comes to women's wrestling. We, we just reviewed War Games, and we talked about Charlotte Flair and Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch and Shotzi and Kyrie Sane and all these excellent women's wrestlers having an excellent cage match. You know, Rhea Ripley's on top of the world as a women's champion. EO Sky's doing great things. Uh, say what you want about AEW, but you know, you got Julia Hart that's making her way up the ranks. You got the super overtimeless Tony Storm. Yes, and here you do. we have um, an injured women's champion in Trish Stratus who's off TV, still with the title. So you got. Chrissy Hemi versus Victoria. And how did this yeah. match come up? <laughs> how do we get here? Stupidest Jerry Springer way possible. So I guess Victoria's baby face role has really worn out its welcome. And yeah. when WWE's got nothing for you, it's time to turn your back heel. They're having a bikini contest on Raw, and Chrissy wins, and Victoria is jealous. So she hits Chrissy with the, uh, the widow's peak, and apparently this move, this spot, was so iconic that it earned its spot on the opening reel for Monday Night Raw. Did oh, you know hell yeah. Hell yeah, I did. Hell yeah, I did. Um, but again, playing to your point, Victoria, her babyface run, I feel like not only wore out its welcome, but I feel like WWE is only strengthening Victoria's presentation by turning her heel. Because my favorite iteration of Victoria <laughs> was when she first arrived on the scene on the main roster. Mm-hmm. The psychotic heel that was obsessed with harming Trish Stratus. You know? it's This this heel Victoria isn't exactly that. But she isn't an L.A. Lakers dancer anymore with a shitty theme song. Like, thank God. Oh, <laughs> you know? no, 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 no. She's bad. She's evil now. So that poppy theme song, it's been slowed down. Go, mm-hmm. go, 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 so, go, go. So, ooh, nothing said bad guy like that. I'm a go, but the pants up. But the, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's so stupid. They just, <laughs> just give her the freaking, but... just freaking give her the everything she said, everything she said, when in my head. Come on, no, come on, no, give her, Vince, give her back Vince. that song. Oh, Ebenezer Vince, he can't be bothered to shell out his money for some licensed music. But um, anywho, but when this match like starts getting underway, it makes me realize something. If Trish Stratus is shoot injured, 
And WWE does not care that much about the women's title to strip her of it. They should have stripped her of it. And yeah. Victoria should have been a champion. Give her something to do and build up this heel persona. They easily could have, like, had a four-way, had a three-way, threw some ladies together and just put the title on Victoria. And this could have been a token women's championship match because without the title, this is really nothing. I agree. It's a really nothing match. I hate to say this because it's kind of your bathroom break match, but... Give Victoria massive props because she, I'm sure, was very unaware that Chrissy Hemi was very inexperienced. And Chrissy Hemi might be the first person to tell you that also. Chrissy Hemi, I mean, bless her soul, but she was a fan of the bit. Yes, but she's a fan of the business and everything. But she was well aware that she couldn't really go in the ring. So she decided I mean, to become a ring tried. announcer down the Yeah. No, she give really her tried. Give her credit for trying, but Victoria definitely carried this match. One hundred and fifty thousand yeah, percent. You know, Christy Hemi, I appreciate her passion, but she's no Maxine Dupree. No. <laughs> no way. No, I mean I'd compare Maxine Dupree more to Stacey Keebler than to Christy Hemi, but you know. Fair. Um in any regard, Victoria goes for the Widow's Peak. Chrissy slips out of it. I mean, there's some decent little reversals in here. These two get five minutes, and uh, I feel like at least a quarter of this match is Chrissy in a headlock. But You know what's sad? Five what? minutes is actually very generous in this time period for the women. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, this match was longer than Chrissy's match at WrestleMania. Yeah. That's and saying something. You know, considering we're in a better place now where Rhea Ripley and Charlotte Flair is candidate for match of the year. <laughs> Insane. And I love it. Yeah. Them. Yeah, I know, right? But uh, Christy Hemi goes for a sunset flip. Victoria blocks it, hits a, like, bonsai drop sit. And uh, basically, she pins Christy Hemi. Her hands are on the ropes. Literally, the second match in the row, and the heel wins by a roll-up and by cheating. Like, I don't know. I don't know. One star, one star for effort, but really nothing special about star, this. Nothing special whatsoever. Um, you know what? You're bringing up a good theme. The first half of this pay per view is very bad. Uh, the second half where it really starts ramping up. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get to that second half in a minute. But uh, bleh, this next match. Well, before we get to that, I would like to talk about this John Cena interview because uh, he comes up to interviewer Todd Grisham. And I'm sorry, but, I mean, when Tomas and I were watching this show, it is very apparent that they were writing Cena's promos to be like The Rock. And, you know, he's putting in all these, like... Because, think about it. Think about it, Tomas. This script is centered around John Cena being the new kid in school. It's like this whole narrative that he's laying out for you. Christian is like the kid in the back of the bus who's picking his boogers. Chris Jericho is the one who's, like, you know, the... The uh, the, what what did he say? He was like the rock star jock the, wearing like the leather yeah. print tights and all that. Like, and Cena is just the kid who's being bullied and being picked on. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> you're trying to sell me on this narrative that John Cena is a bullied victim. Look at him. Just look at how handsome he is. There is you no way what? anybody could bully John Cena. No I chance. I really hate to say this, but I'm watching this promo and I watch like the build to the match. I really thought this gimmick was cool as a kid. Yeah. I really like this. Yeah. This is where the real, like, it's not even like cornball, goofy ass Cena making pee pee poo poo jokes. It's not even that. It's just like, he's trying so hard to be cool when on SmackDown, it was so natural. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. look at the build to the WrestleMania match with JBL. You look at the fucking I quit match he had. And yes. this promo, and I'm not gonna lie, the match later on, I don't want to, you know, bury the lead too much of it. It just shows how thrusted Cena was into this main event role. And I feel like he had a lot of more maturing to do to build to that. And it's just it's very weird looking back on it. And it's kind of like it's a little cringeworthy. I'm not saying the promo was bad, it's just like it's a very outdated Cena. I feel yeah. like Cena looks back at this and he probably cringes over it. Probably cringes over the Todd Pissum line also. Uh, yeah, <laughs> bless Todd it's Grisham's very, heart. He's funny, but like... Yeah, yeah, like... And you know, you talk about Cena being built like The Rock, and the first thing that pops to mind is when he's getting interviewed at New Year's Revolution against Umaga, and he does the... Uh, and Umaga looked at me and he went, 
and it's just like oh my god it was so bad they're writing his promos literally to be like the rock it's so crazy and that'll be that'll be a recurring theme i'm sure as we go through john cena's uh run at the top as the wwe champion here with his uh, brand spanking new spinner title and did you say go yo no go ahead oh i was gonna say let's just say uh it's gonna be it's gonna be a doozy like yeah. crazy looking back at this i'm like wow i i, I actually like this yeah <laughs> i did too i i was into it too it's gonna be a lot of reflecting <laughs> hey hey they got me they jedi mind tricked me into loving this guy and i still do but one more question before we move on did you happen to notice john cena's little thicker boston accent in this promo compared to everything yes. else yeah yes. yeah he would drop that like further on down the line but i'm like and you know, that kind of makes him stand out the boston accent yeah. is like you know it's it's jamming it's jamming Again, a little bit i don't want to bury the lead too much because we're gonna have a whole ass match and talk about this but it's like i don't i want to say this right now i don't i'm not saying i shouldn't have liked cena in this time period it just i look back on it now and i'm like wow i didn't realize how awful his writing was how don't want to say he was a tool but it's like let's just say when I was a kid and I saw the adults booing Cena, I didn't get it. But now I look at it and I'm like, okay, I get it. I, I see really your argument. It. Yeah, we yeah. see your argument, anti-Cena haters. But okay, ladies and gentlemen, this might – thank God this looks like the last time we have to say this. But if you are not a fan of storylines that involve rape, sexual harassment, uh, coercion into getting somebody pregnant, you know, anything that's as devastating as that, if that's triggering for anybody, we recommend skipping ahead maybe 10 minutes to the next thing. But Holy mother of fuck, it's fine. We finally are fucking done with this saga. It's been going on for a year. Thank God. Let's put this fucking storyline in this fucking character out of its misery we have kane going one-on-one with edge in a good old-fashioned grudge match so how do we get here kane as i'm sure y'all are aware is the babyface rapist with lita in his corner um edge is mr money in the bank and these fellas had the final match in the gold rush tournament to determine who would get the next world heavyweight title match on free tv and what they were doing while SmackDown was doing Judgment Day. Yes. Wink, wink, WWE. Wink, wink. Yeah. Triple H, <laughs> I see you building big TV right now. Wink, wink. Maybe you should go back to doing something like that. Yeah. The same. So <laughs> the finish of that match is Lita sliding in the Money in the Bank briefcase to Edge so that Edge can use it as a weapon as Kane is jumping off with his big flying clothesline that he does, which I always love. I love Kane's flying clothesline. It always looks so dope. Oh, yeah. But Edge, it's a it's a really clean swing home run. Wax Kane right in the head. And uh, Lita runs off with the valiant hero who vanquishes the rapist, right? You know, Edge is the hero in this. Uh, uh, no, he's not. Yes. No, he's not. But you mix in the weird Stockholm syndrome with the we like Kane now, and Edge is just freshly turned heel, and it's just I again I look at this as a kid, and I'm like, I fucking really cheered for Kane. So let me get this straight. Kane basically forces Lita into bed with him. K- Lita has Kane's demon spawn. We're booing Kane for a bit. Kane gets pulmonized. At, killed. Yeah, Kane gets pulmonized at Taboo Tuesday after Snitsky kills the baby, punts a fake baby into the crowd. We're supposed to cheer Kane at this point, right? And fast forward a few months, Lita gets Stockholm Syndrome. She starts falling for Kane. And now Lita is basically standing up to her aggressor and running off with her heroic, good looking hero. You know? No, no, no. You don't understand real life situation make edge bad i don't give matt a shit Hardy's still good even though matt hardy not in company i don't give a shit about real wink, life wink. situations i really yeah so essentially they are making kane the surrogate if you will for right now for matt hardy you know because god the matt, comes back. yeah the matt hardy edge lita love triangle is a saga that we will not get into until SummerSlam. No, but you guys know the know story why? I, I don't give a shit about it anymore. I really don't. It yeah. is what it is. It's like even Matt Hardy is saying, like, guys, can we stop talking about this now? It happened. Yeah. Adam are cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, 
Yeah. Matt's married to somebody different. Edge is married to someone different. Lita's married to somebody different. Yes. Lita. <laughs> God, this... all happily married and they all have kids. This is the part of the storyline that, re... yeah, I don't know. Yeah, look, fact check that real quick. But mm -hmm. like the fact that we are like Lita is standing up to the man who's been tormenting her since like a year ago to this point in the retro. She finally stands up to him and runs off with the winner of the match. And we're supposed to boo her now. Like, yeah, it's so weird. Who writes this shit? Who writes it? But, and, you know, it's going to get even worse when Edge and Lita get married on TV and Kane ruins the wedding. He's like, oh, yeah, you know how it feels, motherfucker. You did the same thing. Mm-hmm. You're prior. Um, but you know what? I expected more out of these two. This was a very underwhelming match. Well, I mean, when you... <laughs> This is another pairing that you expect this match to be a freaking banger. And these two have put on good matches on free TV. That Gold Rush tournament match, I found to be much better than this match. And these two would go on to, I believe, have a stretcher match around the time WWE was doing Great American Bash on SmackDown. These two would have their blow-off in a stretcher match on free TV, which I believe Kane won. Um, <laughs> again, the yeah, stretcher it's... match, much better than this. But yeah, yeah, this one, you know, again, yeah, I feel like this match in the Intercontinental title match, it's like we need to have something on the pay per view, and it's just very weird when the pay per view matches under deliver. Like, we're paying for this, yeah, just, eh, it was all right, yeah, yeah, it was fine. Kane is on fire to start the match, no pun intended, as the crowd starts chanting, We want Matt, you know. You're, just wait a couple months. Just wait a couple months, Las Vegas. You're going to get Matt Hardy eventually. Um, good Lord, guys. <laughs> this fucking angle. Lita is going in there, and she is, like, trying to interfere, and Kane is stalking her, and we're supposed to cheer that? Like It's so weird. It, why yeah, are we supposed to? And... Yeah. Okay, go ahead. When you look at it in, 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 in retrospective, it's very weird. Um, Vince is a bit... I'm going to quote Kurt Angle from his recent interview with uh, Inside the Ropes. Yeah, Vince McMahon sure did a lot of weird things. Uh, Vince McMahon's going to hell. <laughs> Angle straight up said Vince is going to hell in a recent interview. And I'm like, I'm just going to pull up that clip when any anytime anyone says anything about Vince. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So Kane is starting to make this like fiery comeback and what have you. Did you forget that Snitsky ran in? Because I, I did. did. Oh my god, I see this fucker come out and I'm like, what are you doing here? Why is Lita like suddenly on your side now? Like it's, after it, it's weird. It's like it, I don't even want to delve into that, but Snitsky is a part of this feud, and I feel like he's edges heavy for like a second. Doesn't make any sense. Really does not make any I sense. Mean, he's there to take the heat whenever Edge runs away. Kane just beats up Snitsky. And remember, Snitsky delivers a speech at their wedding. God. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> and it's Lita. Very weird. Uh, <laughs> Lita forgives hey, him, did I guess. You see, did you see Snitsky randomly return on Raw the other week? Like I did. A month ago? I did. Good for Snitsky, man. Good for him. Uh, sign him back, please. Like, mm -hmm. unironically, sign him back. He's great. He's great. You know what? I'm Okay. What's today? The 7th? Yeah, today is December 6th. De no, de thank you. December 6th, 2023. This is on video for everyone, so you can quote me. S calling it now, Snitsky will be in the Royal Rumble. In ah, Calling interesting. Right now. Interesting. He's going to be a surprise entrant. Mm. He's there. He already made his presence. It's not, I mean, it's going to be a surprise, but people are like, oh yeah, Snitsky, you know, showed up back in the company. I feel like they might have a job for him backstage, but how fucking cool would that be if Snitsky yeah. showed up in the room? That's a dark horse pick. I would love that. If his It Wasn't My Fault music hit throughout Tropicana Field, that would be awesome. But, um, yeah, so this is around the point. So Snitsky makes the Valiant save when Kane wraps a steel chair around Lita's neck like he's going to pilmanize Lita. Like, it, again, how am I so supposed weird. to cheer for this fucker? How am I supposed to cheer for him? So weird. So, like, so very, very weird. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't make sense to me. Kane counters out of an execution attempt. Uh, Snitsky runs back in. 
Kane is choking Snitsky out. Uh, Edge is charging in with the Money in the Bank briefcase, and he accidentally hits Snitsky right in the noggin. Kane hits a gigantic choke slam on the Rated R Superstar. Uh, 11 minutes, Kane wins. Okay. I mean, a little overbooked for the monster babyface beating the heel, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. The monster. I get it. The yeah. monster, oh, no pun intended, but the monster push they're giving Edge right now, they gave him the briefcase. They gave him the world title match on Raw. They gave him the new valet. He's coming in with a lot of momentum. I get wanting to protect that, but at the same time, again, it, it's Kane. Like, Kane should be able to squash Edge pretty easily. It yeah. It's just been a competitive match with a normal finish. All the while, Kane is acting as a surrogate for the man the crowd actually wants to see in this storyline against uh, Edge and Lita. But we'll get to that at SummerSlam, and we will cover that saga when we get to that point. But as it sits... Say, after, this, yeah. after this feud, Kane's going to get involved with something a lot more fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's crazy we're not talking about that show on May 19th. May 19th. Oh, that's next year. That's yeah. next year. What we'll are you going to do first is a lot more fun. And we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. But I'm going to... Two stars. Uh, yeah, it was... I expected yeah. better. I yeah, expected this, more out of these two. This match got 11 minutes. And again, it's like one of those pairings that you expect since both guys are solid workers and Kane's matches are always fucking easy in CM Punk's words. Like, you'd expect them to have at least decent chemistry, but they just never did. It's like watching a match between The Undertaker and The Rock because their yeah. matches were never good. But I feel like they yeah. had some decent matches in 2010 when they were feuding for the world title when the roles are reversed. Uh, but that is neither here nor there. Um, mm. Yeah, it, it was all right. It, it yeah. was all right. But you know what wasn't just all right? This, this next match. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get into it. This is a match that's not talked about a lot. It's a WrestleMania rematch. Shawn Michaels against the newly drafted Kurt Angle. How do yes. we get here? How do we get here? Kurt Angle is drafted to Raw. Shawn Michaels sees a window of opportunity to get a little bit of redemption. He challenges Kurt Angle to a good old-fashioned, respectable wrestling match here on this Vengeance card. Kurt Angle accepts, and we're here. Shawn Michaels is interviewed by Todd Pissum before the match, and uh, Angle guaranteed that he would make Shawn Michaels tap on this card. But Michael said that he wants Kurt to be 100% confident going into this contest. Uh, he said, thanks to the draft lottery, they get a rematch. Uh, <laughs> it's such a cliche promo because he's like, vengeance will be mine. <laughs> you know what? And I'm just noticing this now that you bring that up. You can tell that Brian Danielson is Shawn Michaels' number one pupil. Because I look at what Danielson's doing now. And it again, the mannerisms, the way he conducts himself in the ring, the excellent matches he's producing. He's kind of this generation Shawn Michaels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really is. He really is. Brian Danielson, Shawn Michaels, star people. Yeah, Every... it's like the same awkward dad aura they both have. It's like, yeah, <laughs> if anyone else would have dropped that line, it would have been cringy. But you hear Shawn Michaels and Danielson drop these lines. It's like, I forgive you because Shawn... I love you. Sean coming out with like a like a weird sash instead of like his normal like fucking yeah um, <laughs> such weird let's gear. Get this out of okay before we get into the match. Um, this is kind of like the evolution of Kurt Angle's character. We already talked about whatever the hell he was doing at Judgment Day, but Ugh. this was in a way it would morph into the wrestling machine, and that's where Kurt Angle is based. Like no more nonsense, no more dancing around with a little cowboy hat. I'm not doing anything for anyone else but me. He is vicious. He is malicious. He only cares about one thing and one thing only, and that's breaking people's ankles and just being an yes. absolute killer in the ring. This is probably my favorite iteration of Kurt Angle here. Same. Same. 100%. Yeah. Like, the picture up there of him with the World Heavyweight title belt, like, that is easily far and away my favorite iteration of the Kurt Angle character. Like, this is just the legitimate athlete that we all knew was in there. And this guy does not care about, you know, he doesn't care about prancing around in tiny ass cowboy hats anymore. Doesn't care about driving milk trucks. Doesn't care about any of the goofy shit, even though he's proven he can do that. But now he's here to prove that he is the best on the planet. And, uh, and let's address the elephant in the room now. 
You know, like they say, the sequel is never as good as the first, unless it's Toy Story 2. Yeah. So let's get this out of the way now. This is nowhere near of the amazing, like, just the majestic feeling we got at WrestleMania, because that match no. was on another level. But I'm going to defend this match. I still think this match was excellent, and I think this was such a technical prowess of how good these guys are. It was mm -hmm. just such... they they're, their, their styles just mesh very well together. And they have great chemistry on a technical level. And there's this one spot I want to point out now. Shawn Michaels delivers, like, the stiffest elbow I've ever seen him deliver. To shot to Kurt Angle right on the bridge of his nose. And it's so, like, it's so good that not only does WWE replay it, they replay it in slow motion. And you just see, like, the point of Michaels' elbow go into the bridge of Angle's nose. And mm -hmm. you know damn well when they were putting together this match, Angle was like, don't fucking hold back on me. Like, no. if you need to hit me for real, hit me for real. Yeah. Shawn Michaels isn't known for being stiff, but he was he was a little stiff in this match. He was. He was. And Angle was licking it in right back, like getting his spots in. Like, these guys did not hold back. Again, I am in agreement with you. This match is nowhere near the million-star match they had at WrestleMania 21, but... This is still an outstanding wrestling match here. And these guys, again, had impeccable chemistry. The drama was certainly there. Either guy certainly could have won. Shawn Michaels was in the ankle lock for God knows how long. Kurt Angle bleeding from the mouth once again, proving that I'm like, this whole stretch of summer pay-per-views is probably the reason why Kurt had to wear a mouthpiece the rest of his run. You know? Because <laughs> just so his mouth wouldn't bleed anymore. But, um... Yeah, these guys, I mean, there's some great near falls. They fight out towards the announce table. I don't think, yeah, Michaels doesn't, like, do his big old plancha that he did at WrestleMania. Oh, he didn't no, repeat no. that. Salt, he saves that for WrestleMania because you see this one at 21, the one he does at 23, and the one he does at 24, that is punishment on Michaels' body. Yeah. Oh, it's just God. We also get a uh, we get a ref bump as Shawn Michaels rolls out of the ankle lock. Uh, then they start, you know, they start brawling around. Uh, Angle is holding on to this ankle lock like a freaking pit bull. The referee eventually comes to it's, you know, it's great drama. The sweet chin music out of desperation, you know, kick out by Kurt. And this crowd is just on the edge of their seat. They're loving that every bit of this match. Probably one of my favorite favorite Shawn Michaels cliches, and he would do it later in this latter run of his career. And it's when Kurt Angle did at WrestleMania 2. It's when the opponent just grabs Michaels by the ears. He's holding up by the hair. He's screaming insults on him, stay down, stay down. And then Michaels, out of nowhere, slaps him off, hits that super kick, and they both just collapse yeah. on the ground. It's an excellent spot. And you know what? The super kick may have been ruined to hell in today's day and age. Not a single person on this planet here, now, or forever, will deliver a super kick as good as Shawn Michaels. Fuck you, Nick and Matt. Fuck you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, me. you know. <laughs> um, bastardize that move. Yeah, so excellent near falls towards the end. Kurt gets the upper hand, and this is where my big issue with this match comes in. It's actually this finish. I found it to be extremely contrived, because Kurt Angle goes up to the top rope, and he goes for absolutely nothing he just jumps off the top and he meets Shawn michaels with a sweet chin music they were trying to recreate the magic that sean hit when he uh nailed shelton with a sweet chin music out of nowhere in that infamous gold rush tournament match on raw oh we should have talked about that yeah well do you, you want to talk about it real quick we can yes because i have an, actually a very vivid memory about this and i would like to share it Go ahead. This is one of my favorite matches on Raw history, and now I'm a little embarrassed that I forgot about it. It's okay. Shawn Michaels versus Shelton Benjamin. These fools went for like 20 minutes on TV. It stretched like two commercial breaks. And I remember, as a kid, remember, this is fantastic match. There's no DVR. Um, our, we didn't have a VCR that could record anymore, so I wasn't able to record this. And my brother was playing Little League. And considering I'm, what, 10 years old? Still not old enough to stay home alone by myself, especially at night. So we had to go to the game, but I begged my mom, please let me finish this match. This is like two of my favorite wrestlers. I just want to finish this match and we can go. And the longer the match went, the more <laughs> he wanted to go. I'm like, mom, just wait until this match is over. And then 
the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Halfway across the ring, Shelton Benjamin does a springboard and he eats a super kick. Out of nowhere. Like my 10 year old mind is blown. One, two, three, turn off the TV. Okay, let's go. Yeah, of course. Of course they had to be the finish. Like, of all things, if Shelton had kicked out of that, that probably would have ruined the moment. It probably would have ruined a bit of Shawn Michaels' mystique, in my opinion. But he would have kicked out of it in 2023. Uh, yeah, yeah, he he would have. He would have. But uh, no, they were they were trying to recreate that spot here at Vengeance. But my problem with it is. Kurt Angle really had zero aerial offense except for the moonsault that he always missed. So this spot to me felt extremely forced. Like they were really trying to catch lightning in a bottle twice, but it it just didn't work because Kurt Angle wasn't a high flyer like Shelton was. I get where you're coming from. I still thought it was cool. I thought it was a really cool way to end the match. I will agree with you that this match, this rematch, was a little more contrived. It was a little more full of itself because they knew how good the match at Mania 21 was. And spoiler alert, they're going to have an excellent 30-minute Iron Man match on the the, two, the, the Raw Homecoming when yep. Raw comes back to the USA Network. Mm-hmm. And, that, and this is still, quote-unquote, the weakest match. And I feel like it's contrived yeah. in a way that you didn't need the ref bump. You didn't need any of that extra overbooking nonsense you look at the match at mania 21 straight wrestling from start to finish i feel like they tried a little too hard here but i still think this match is excellent and you know what fuck it i'm gonna give it four and a half stars i'm gonna match it believe it or not i'm gonna match it i mean it's not again it's nowhere close to a million stars like i gave the mania match it probably would have gotten five if you didn't have as forced of an ending as you had here but It was still a damn good match. These guys displayed that they had great chemistry. And now, Michaels and Angle are one apiece. They've each won a pay-per-view match over one another. And that Raw Homecoming match should have been the rubber match, right? It should have been the deciding factor in the feud. But that fucking match ended in a draw. And we never got a conclusive finish to this feud. Because Kurt was a coward. Kurt in character was a coward. And he didn't want to go to sudden death with Shawn Michaels. But it's... Yeah, no, it. <laughs> I'm still so yeah. bitter about that. I'm still so Dang. bitter about that to this day. Like, like why could you have just ended? Like, that's a Vince McMahon special, though. Like, he just, it is. you know, he just has the most, like, we've praised him already, you know, with his draft lottery brouhaha, but, like, he just had this tendency to just not finish stories where they should. You know, it's, it's kind of like he just loved Angle and Michael so much that he didn't want to see the loser out of it. But you know what I've learned about pro yeah. wrestling this past year? What's that? There's got to be a winner and there's got to be a loser. Being yeah. the loser doesn't mean you're diminished. You're done for. You can never come back from it. It's just there's got to be a winner and there's got to be a loser. Everyone needs mm-hmm. to get over themselves. Oh, Damn you straight. Protect so-and-so. There's got to be a winner. There's got to be a loser. <clears throat> it's yeah. how you book the loser after the fact that matters. Yeah, that that will you know, be a re- that will be yeah. a recurring theme as we get into SummerSlam and what Shawn Michaels does there, huh? <laughs> yep. Yeah, 100%, big time. Yes. I can't wait to get um, into that. But up next is probably you know what Michaels and Angle. You know, all three of these matches are so good, but this was probably the most fun match of the evening. It's it was- John Cena newly drafted. Whoa, wait, whoa, 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 whoa! Time out, time out. We got to talk about something really important before this match. You're forgetting something. There's a very oh, obvious... Oh, no. <laughs> There's an obvious uh, discrepancy in the ring announcing on this card. You might have noticed right. that a That's very right. that a very young Justin Roberts was ring announcing this show. Making his pay-per-view debut. Yep. And I think he did a good job. He did a good job, you know, sitting in that spot. But Lillian Garcia makes her way out to the ring... And she introduces the 500-pound world's largest love machine, Viscera, who she has been having uh, quite the nice item with on TV. And uh, right, Lily, if you remember this angle? I didn't. That's right. I, <laughs> I didn't. But uh, anyway, uh, Viscera comes out there as a couch in the middle of the ring. Viscera is wearing like a pajama-like robe. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just it's it's oh god, this is so cringe. Lillian so Garcia just pajamas. Who gives a shit, Vince, about you and your weird fucking fetish about the world's largest disc and the world's biggest app, the world's largest pair of trousers trousers, the world's largest pair of shoes, Vince? Whatever you masturbate to is none of our business, okay? Yeah. Keep that shit off TV. Vince so likes weird. his big beefy men, but so um weird. Yeah. So yeah, this man who a couple of months ago was coming out in this big gigantic cape and dressed up like a vampire, and now here he is just in the weirdest like looking pajama like patterns out there. Lillian Garcia. You continue. Yeah, go ahead. Nelson Fraser really deserved better. He did. He did, man. He did. I mean, the fact that been a, the hoss of hosses. God, the fact that. He was going through his wrestling career, and I didn't even know this until I read up on it. Uh, Nelson Fraser was uh, diabetic, believe it or not. And he was going through, and he was doing all those wrestling moves, and he was doing spinning heel kicks. And it's like, honestly, if you think about it, it's pretty inspiring Like <laughs> that a guy like that went through the wrestling business and the rigors of it and the schedule of it. And, you know, he was fighting that the entire time. It's just, it's it's really cool. It's really cool when you read up on that. But... Lillian Garcia sings this lad a song beautifully, might I add. And it sounds oh, like yeah. it was... Lillian Garcia is an excellent singer. She's known for singing America the Beautiful at all of these events. Um, I, confession time, she released a, 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 a Spanish album. I bought that shit on iTunes and I listen to it all the time. That girl... I, she's, she's got amazing. pipes. She's got pipes, man. Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, she gets down on her knee and, uh, she does not, uh, she does not basically bow down to the former King Mabel, former King of the Ring winner, mind you. Uh, she gets she down on her knee. She basically her best Al Woods impression and proposes to Viscera. Yeah, yeah, basically, it, seeing as how they're in Las Vegas and people get married there on a whim, like, all the time. Um, so Viscera has to think about it for a second, but they are interrupted by the Godfather of all people, the Godfather. And, uh, God, the skimpiest outfits you have ever seen on the Godfather's female escorts. Yeah, he got a good pop. He got a really good Godfather pop too. Cool. Yeah, the, yeah. The crowd. I'm sure the crowd was not expecting the Godfather to make an appearance here, but you know, <laughs> it's. A, I, I love the Godfather, man. It's a really cool character. It's a fun character. My innocence. When I didn't understand Godfather's gimmick. Yeah, yeah. He's uh selling uh selling white women to people, you know, that's his whole <laughs> gimmick, you know, <laughs> as he as he would reveal on Dark Side of the Ring. That was his favorite gimmick. But Godfather enters the ring and he tells uh how was calling Nelson Frazier, tells Viscera, Man, what happened to you? You used to be a pimp in training. And I'm just like looking back on it now, I'm like I blame, here's the thing, I'm a big hip-hop fan, so don't think I'm, like, shaming it, but sure. I blame hip-hop music and, you know, 50 Cent P.I.M.P. and Snoop Dogg calling himself a pimp for putting the word pimp into such a glorified light that everybody wanted to be the pimp. And then you look back and I'm like, no, being a pimp is bad. Very, <laughs> very bad. Very, 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 very bad. You think? <laughs> You yeah, think? <laughs> no, Godfather's gimmick isn't a 2000s gimmick. It's a 90, late 90s gimmick. But, oh, you know, for the love of really God, coined that phrase. And he made it like the coolest thing in the world. And you look at it he now, did. it's like, imagine someone coming out with the gimmick, I'm the sex trafficker. <laughs> I don't even know, man. But yeah, he, um, so weird. Viscera... Remember, we talked about it at Backlash. His new gimmick is that he's a horny bastard, and he doesn't want to be tied down to uh, one woman the rest of his life, even though Lillian Garcia is a very beautiful woman, and he would be very yes, lucky to have her. Yeah, but Viscera decides to get aboard the trade, as he says, and Lillian Garcia is left alone in the ring, completely dejected in tears. Fuck this guy. How am I supposed to cheer him? In character, how am I supposed to cheer this man? Because he like is... the biggest piece of shit on the planet, and I just wanted to yeah. give her a hug. Yeah! <laughs> just wanted to give her a hug. Jesus Christ, yeah. I and wanted the... to give her a hug and said, hey, come and hang out with us tonight. We'll show you that that guy's just a big fucking asshole. Yeah, yeah, and we'll just we'll just vent about him the entire night. And then I vividly remember, I think it was actually the next night on Raw, 
when Lillian is announcing Viscera to the ring for his match, and she's in tears, and she can't yeah. finish. The, she can't finish the introduction. Like, fuck, dude. You know, like, and I'm supposed to cheer for Viscera. How is this guy the baby face? Like, explain that to me. Explain this that to so me, weird. viewers. This is going to hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> now that we've gotten that angle out of the way, let's continue on to what Tomas wanted to talk about. It yeah, is a it is a vengeance special. It feels like a lot of vengeance pay per views. There is a triple threat match for the WWE Championship, and here we are. John Cena is defending against Chris Jericho and Christian. How do we get here? This is a. It started off as a one on one match. Believe it or not, Christian Cage was given the one on one match against John Cena for the WWE Championship. Yes. Basically, as you saw in the build for the past year, which is excellently done, Christian Cage has basically been saying, "Like, I don't want to go to SmackDown, but if I did go to SmackDown, I could feud with the Undertaker. I could feud with JBL. I could feud with Booker T. And you know, you know, maybe John Cena. He's kind of like doing this weird like." He's got this. I don't care about Cena. I don't care about Cena. Yeah, he does. If I did care about Cena, I'd say he's stupid. I'd say his rap is stupid. I'd say everything about him is stupid. It's just weird. I don't want to use this phrase, but I don't even remember what the phrase is, but it's a phrase used in anime. And it's basically like the, the I don't like you. I, I don't like you. Why, why are you saying oh, I like God. you? It's this weird, like, crush thing. I know I this. Know. You can I know this. Me for even mentioning this, but um, it's a trope. God, it's, 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 Cage has been doing that. it's frustrating me that I don't know the term. And I'm sure after this podcast is over, it'll come back to me. But John Cena. Sunday and, night. Sunday night. Oh, there it is. There Sunday it is. Night. Yep. You're yeah. right. Christian the, Cage is like a Sunday night to John Cena. And the reverse happens. Cage, Christian Cage doesn't go to SmackDown yet. But he, John Cena comes to him. It's like, he didn't have to go to Cena, but Cena came to him. Christian finally challenges Cena to a match on the highlight reel. And this is where the cringy Cena stuff comes out. And he's like, he's making fun of Christian and Tomko. And then he does, he says some insults that I'm just like, yeah, he's trying way too hard to be the rock here. Yeah. Well, I mean, the rap does definitely bury Christian and his character, which did feel like a well-warranted buildup because Christian has been so, like, obsessed with trying to get at John Cena ever since Cena embarrassed him at the Royal Rumble. Like, Christian has been wanting to get his, like, his revenge, in his words. Also, it's very important to point out that this started when Cena got drafted to Raw and he was on the highlight reel, and then Christian challenged him to the match, and then Cena does... I don't know if I li I love this or hated it, but he says, get a load of my five second pose. <laughs> I I uh. I didn't get it as a kid, because you know, I didn't watch Edge and Christian um as a kid in the Attitude Era. But now looking at it, I was like, that was actually kind of clever. It was Chris stupid, but it was clever. Christian you succumbed to the ring up through the fire, wearing a Seinfeld shirt, thinking that you was a vampire. <laughs> Again, I like it, but we'll get into that later. But mm -hmm. it's really important to notice that Chris Jericho is starting to get very frustrated. He hasn't been doing anything. He points out he hasn't had a one-on-one -on -one championship match in three years. That's good continuity. That is yeah. good continuity. Good on you, Vince McMahon, and for once. He's very, yeah, he's very frustrated that Christian gets the title shot, but not him. And he's trying to prove himself. Bischoff is brushing him off. So... Jericho turns heel and attacks Cena after a tag team match. Yes. He beats Cena down, and then he goes into Bischoff and says, there, was that good enough? Can I get a championship match now? And Bischoff says, yes, and he makes it a triple threat match. There is a tiny part of me that really wishes this would have been Cena and Christian one-on-one, -on -one. because I feel like yeah. this could have been Christian's coming out party. It would have been. It would have been. But, again, it definitely feels to me like Cena was also still in that, like, phase where he was just kind of – getting used to being a ring general and like working all these dates here and there. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's I, part of me is definitely glad that Jericho is in this match. 100%. But here's the thing. You say Cena becoming a ring general. He sure as hell wasn't a ring general here because the number one nitpick I have with this match. And this is where I realized I, I understand why people didn't like Cena here. He was really exposed to this match and Jericho and Christian really outclassed him. 
That was your number one nitpick? I thought it was going to be the fact that the referee was, like, enforcing oh, the I mean, rules. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. And that was just, like, a, a funny, like, in, in, in inconsistent thing. But watching this match, it was really good. But I feel like Christian and Jericho were carrying, like, 90% of the workload. Yeah. Like, it was their job to make Cena look really good in this match. And then Cena was just going to take all the glory. And I feel like that was Cena's biggest issue in this first couple years of his run. His yeah. opponents were making him look amazing. Not saying Cena was lazy. Not saying Cena wasn't putting in the work. But a lot of the matches were 90% of his, 90 his opponent. And then the 10% Cena comeback. Yeah. I wonder what uh, the agents were telling all of Cena's opponents before every match. Hey. You got to make him look really strong. <laughs> this is what kind of the, the Super Cena thing is born. Good callbacks considering uh, CM Punk has just rejoined the fray. CM Punk has entered the chat. Yeah. CM Punk, oh, wait. You know CM Punk question. has entered the chat. Uh, nobody tell uh, this Christian, by the way, that John Cena's father worked in the business and uh, Christian could have definitely, uh, you know, made fun of John Cena's father and the fact that John Cena had a father who was a total geek, but... Um, you know, it's a good thing CM Punk's not in AEW anymore because if Christian Cage found out CM Punk didn't have a father, <laughs> CM Punk's father. Oh, hey, hey, Christian Cage has entered the chat. We're talking about dead fathers now, but uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, so early on in this match. Christian's problem solver, Tyson Tomko. Remember him? Yeah, he's still relevant somehow. He, Tomko had but... his one flash of relevancy at that Royal Rumble promo. Hey, Tomko, yeah. give me a fee. No. No. <laughs> Only no. cool thing he's ever done. You, you don't ever. pay me enough. You don't pay yeah. me enough. Uh, <laughs> but, Only yeah. Only thing Tomko ever did. Well, I mean, certainly not pulling the top rope down on John Cena and then referee Earl Hebner catching Tomko and ejecting him. In a no disqualification contest, why, why does Earl Hebner care so much? Like, because <laughs> Earl Hebner is one of the fucking in most inconsistent referees I've ever seen in my life. We yeah. talked about this at Backlash. Mm -hmm. No wonder Vince released him the next year. But anyway, uh... <laughs> no, that's because he was selling T-shirts out of the trunk of his car. Yeah, yeah. What a scumbag, huh? So uh, mm -hmm. first he screws Brett, and then he sells loop, uh, <laughs> like uh, I almost said loop bag T-shirts. That's not <laughs> bootleg, bootleg oh, T-shirts. Yeah, it was boot. I thought he was stealing merch from the WWE, like the merch stands, and then he was selling it out of the out of the trunk of his car, like at marked up prices. Yeah. Um, or was he making his own merch? He might. I don't know, but. In any case, uh, Christian took a hard bump to the floor, taking an attitude adjustment uh, from Cena over the top rope. Christian mm -hmm. tried to block it, and then Cena just fucking, like, plants Christian tailbone first on the floor. And it's like... Gee, wouldn't it have been nice if Tomko was there to take the bump? Yeah, the problem solver. Thank you, Earl. Thank you, Earl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Jericho flies back in with a uh, top rope Judas effect onto John Cena. Jericho comes back with a bulldog. Uh, Lion salt by Jericho doesn't work. Um, there's a, yeah, I mean, this is a fun triple threat match, it's man. I don't know. It's a very fun match. It's a very fast paced one at uh, 15 minutes or so. I mean, these guys, I think, got the just the right amount of time because the matches uh, that sandwich this one definitely get the meat of the show but for what yeah, it is and here's the thing i thought the finish was actually very fun and creative uh cena goes for the attitude adjustment on christian he uses christian's legs to knock jericho in the face and then he hits the the attitude adjustment on christian to get the win and retain yeah here's well my thing and i just realized cena has been the was there anything about spots for the match before? Yeah, I well, I mean, this match had a lot of fun spots. They had the cliche Tower of Doom spot, but the crowd reacted to it in a big way. Like, they had never seen a Tower of Doom spot before in a triple threat match. And, uh, yeah, no, that was really cool. Cena hitting a double five-knuckle shuffle on both of his opponents. Oh, yes, yes. The when he realized... Was born here. Yeah, Ten Knuckles Shuffle was born here, and the look on his face when he saw that he had an opportunity to do it to both opponents. It just, Cena, I don't know what it is about him, but there's just something that endears me to how he reacts to certain things in the ring. Like, you can oh, yeah. tell, you can tell that this guy has been a lifelong fan. Like, and he Absolutely. loves a bit of this, but. Uh, I hate to be so negative about Cena because I've been talking about him so positively after WrestleMania, but here's the thing that I noticed. 
such a sudden change in environment for Cena. He went from the smaller Friday show or the Thursday show, the B show, as you know, I hate to say, but it was the B show to the flagship show. He is the main center. He's going to be the main centerpiece on the longest running episodic television show in history. They're putting a lot on him. He grew so organically on SmackDown, but I feel like the weird transition for him is like, he just beat JBL and we were sick of JBL. We wanted a new champion. So Cena got that accolade. I think he was doing so well. He had that excellent I Quit Magic Judgment Day. Yeah. Now he's quickly jumping over to Raw and he's wrestling two guys that are kind of getting over or either established with the crowd or they're getting over like a Christian. And I well, feel like there would have been a lot of fans that would wanted to see Jericho or Christian win the title. And the fact is Jericho has uh, Jericho. I mean, that goes without saying, cause he's been a workhorse for so freaking long in this company, but Christian getting his first opportunity at a world title in this promotion, when he's been a journeyman for them for about seven years at this point, like, I <laughs> like the older like the older fan in me definitely would have loved to have seen Christian win the title but the fact that John Cena just won this belt and the fact that he was just drafted over to Raw like there was yeah. no way that he was losing this there was absolutely no like chance also, he was losing if it was the one on one Christian and Cena match like we were supposed to get I could have seen it being one of those matches where Christian would have gotten the crowd behind him and they would have booed Cena yeah, but, uh, yeah, no, the finish of this match, Jericho, uh, oh, by the way, Christian tried to use the WWE title belt as a weapon. Earl Hebner told him to put it back again, even though there's no fucking disqualifications. Why does he care so much? He like, brings up the question, what if Christian used the title? What would have happened? Yeah, you what? does? Him? No! Didn't do anything, so why should he deserve to lose this match? Exactly! Exactly, you know, <laughs> like so. Um, Tomko runs interference, even though he's been ejected and there's no disqualifications. Uh, Christian gets a nice near fall off of that, and you get a Tell nice. Me, Tom, write that down. Write that down. Write yeah. that down. If you're you ejected, get, you can just come back. You you get such a nice throwback to the temper tantrum Christian of 2002, where he's just like flubbing around on the ring mat like a dead fish, and it's just so funny. He goes. Uh, Jericho has Cena locked in the walls of Jericho for a bit too, which is you know a very dramatic spot in and of itself um christian goes for a kill switch on jericho jericho pushes christian into cena who picks him up for the fu kicks away jericho with christian's foot hits the fu on christian and then pins him 15 minute match it was really really yeah, fun i just i feel so conflicted right now because i'm not saying cena's bad and that he was bad in this match i just feel like he's so outclassed and as we go later on in this retrospective, when we get to like SummerSlam and Unforgiven and Taboo Tuesday, it just feels like Cena is outclassed. He's going to be wrestling guys like Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle. Yeah. And, -on -on match. and it's just like, you can see the experience. And it's very weird because he worked with like The Undertaker and Booker T and Brock Lesnar. Like, you know, I mean, Lesnar, that doesn't count because he's in the same class as Cena. But you know what I mean? Yeah, veterans, like Eddie and RVD, and it's like he fared very well with them. But once you put him in the ring with like Christian and Jericho and Angle and Michaels, he just seems outclassed. Well, I see what you're saying, but let me counter by saying this: How do you expect John Cena to get better in the ring if he doesn't work with the absolute best in the world? You know oh, what yeah, I'm saying? 100. Like, it's just a very rocky start. It's a very. This is a rocky run for Cena. Yeah, it is. But the matches you can't deny, Tomas. They were really good in this reign. His matches. I mean, I'm not saying that John Cena was like the reason. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure 90 percent of the time, the reason why his matches with uh, Jericho were so good is because Jericho was the ring general in there. The reasons why his matches with Angle were so good were that Angle might have been carrying him around this point. But, I mean, he needed to have the best of the best come up to him because he's the top dog. He's carrying the title. And everybody... Oh, yeah, 100%. And, again, I would be a hypocrite if I said Cena sucked in this period because I was the biggest Cena maniac. Cena I was. Me too. I was Me too. Jersey and the chain and the having the fake title belt and having the hat. And it's just like, you look at his merch and be like, wow, I really walked around school wearing that shit. <laughs> oh, God. Him. Yeah. I loved him as a kid. 
And I'm not saying I don't love rewatching this stuff now. I just see certain aspects of Cena in this time period. And I'm just like, I get it. I, I yeah. get why you guys didn't like him. I'm going to give this match three and three quarters, though, all things considered, because this would have this could have easily gotten four if you didn't have those little hiccups in there with the rules and like what the rules of a triple threat match actually were. But I thought all three did. I thought all three played their parts really well. Fifteen minutes is fifteen minutes was the perfect amount of time for this match. And I think everybody got their chances to shine like people like Christian, even even though he's kind of a geek, he looks pretty good at defeat here. You know, he got close a good handful of times, but... And this is a better time to say it. It's a good thing we had this match because it's time both these guys are going to be out of the company. Yeah, well, Christian gets moved over to SmackDown, and we'll talk about him a couple more times on this retro on the WWE side, but... But I mean, by October, they're both going to be out. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're very right. But let, let's enjoy them while we still can, huh? Let's enjoy them, but because uh, we ain't gonna be talking about one of them for two years, and we ain't gonna be talking about the other for four years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unless we decide to review some TNA pay per views, right? <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> destination? What? De- yeah. Let let us know in the comments if you want to hear us talk about some old TNA pay per views with uh, old school Christian Cage on them, and let let us know, please. But it's just Samoa Joe versus Kurt Angle versus Sting. Yeah, some good yeah. matches. It, there's a lot of good ones. I mean, even his ones with Jeff Jarrett, where he won the title. Like, I, yeah, I enjoyed that one. Know. Yeah, yeah. No, he had some good ones, man. But, uh, yeah, let us know down in the comments if you want to see us review any TNA shows from back in the day. But, oh, boy. <sighs> Main event time, Tomas. This is it. This is the culmination Ooh. of, like, one of the big, like, running jokes on this podcast, on this retro. Like, for so long, it's been building up to this match. Before we get into it, there was a backstage segment where Batista was being interviewed by Jonathan Coachman, and him and Triple H came to blows, and I'm going to say this now, wasn't a fan of it. These guys are going to be in a hell in a cell match, and I just didn't feel the need to see them get into a backstage brawl before the match. It's like, they're going to be in hell in a cell. Leave it at that. This seemed redundant. It just seemed like it ruined the special moment that these guys are going to meet in the ring later today. Yeah, I've talked about not a huge fan of the main event coming out before the show, uh, and like we even saw in the recent AEW pay per view with the Jay White, Adam Cole, and MJF bullshit. It's mm-hmm. just like it's kind of like, and this may be going a little too far, but it's kind of like the bride and the groom not seeing each other before the ceremony. That they yeah. need to be kept away from each other on TV, and it just just felt like we're done there. Anywho. This is the culmination, like you said, of the WrestleMania feud between Batista and Triple H. Um, Once Triple H lost the rematch at Backlash, Triple H took his ball and he went home. He realized he can't beat Batista. If he can't be the world champion, he doesn't want to be here anymore. He left for a good bunch, which was really good, and left Batista on his own. They had the Gold Rush tournament. Batista defeated Edge in a world championship match just for Triple H to return. He beat down Batista. He hit him with the sledgehammer. He bloodied him up. He leaned over Dave and he said, vengeance, hell in a cell. This is where he's going to die. It is. This is where he's going to die. And they were hyping it up that Triple H has never lost a one-on-one hell in a cell match in his career. He has ended careers inside the cell. We've talked about his match with Mick Foley at No Way Out 2000. We've talked about his match against Chris Jericho at Judgment Day 02. We've talked about all of them, actually. Thinking about it, Kevin yeah, Nash, uh, Shawn Michaels. Mm-hmm. You know, Tomas is like for some reason it's one of his favorite matches of all time. That it's Hell in a Cell a match, great match. Even though it's way too fucking long. Hey, hey guys, real quick. You want me to trigger Tomas real quick? You want to see how to trigger him? This match with Batista was better than the one with Shawn Michaels. It was better. Because you cut off half the time, and uh, it's a better-paced match. It's a more fun watch. Excellent, excellent match. This is the debut of Saliva's I Walk Alone. Oh, 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Top 10 theme songs. Sorry. I fucking love (laughs) this song. I, it wouldn't be another year until they released this theme on the Reckless Intent album, which I begged for for Christmas, just so I could listen to Batista's theme song. Again, kids. This was back before the days of streaming services. This was before your Spotify's. So if you wanted WWE theme music, you just had to pray that your favorite theme song would get released on one of these albums. This was even before the days of YouTube. 
So I remember mm-hmm. when that Reckless Intent album dropped, I begged for it. I got it. I popped into my CD player and I listened to Batista's theme song on loop. It is so freaking good. Yeah. And every now and then on my Spotify, you know, like listening to it, I'll pop it on. It is, it encapsulates Batista's energy better than anything else in his career. It's as someone who is a big fan of Saliva too, and all of their songs, all the pay per view theme songs that they supplied WWE through the Ruthless Aggression era, all their songs are really good, in my opinion. But there's just something about I Walk Alone that makes it feel like, oh, yeah, ugh, that, that's probably the most iconic theme. Always and ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. That's three saliva songs for WWE. Superstar is a good one. The Mania 18 theme. Um, I love, yeah, Always is like one of their best pay per view theme songs they've ever put out. Ladies and gentlemen is a good one. Uh, Hunt You Down, No Way Out 2009. That's a freaking awesome theme song. I can't believe you forgot about that one. Yeah, that's a great one. You know, they said Limp Biscuit would dub was WWE's favorite band. My favorite WWE band is always going to be Saliva. Everyone yep. watching a backstage vignette of Saliva's lead singer recording the theme song for Batista. It's a fantastic theme, but enough gushing over Batista's theme. This felt like it finally completed the package for Batista. He's a superstar. He's got the World Heavyweight Championship. But this is going to be his final test. Can he survive? Can he hang with Triple H and Hell in a Cell? And this was a <clears throat> bloody affair. They this was... All- this was Basically violent. One weapon, a yeah. barbed wire wrapped steel chair. It's not the only weapon, but I feel like this is the weapon that gets used the most. And I feel like it's like the true initiation for a superstar. Like Batista, we talked about his green era. You know, he got this uh, big push and the big storyline. But can he go in there and can he take barbed wire? And there were no thumbtacks in the match, but you know what I mean. The barbed wire, the tables, the steel steps. Can he go in there? with the master of the Hell in a Cell match, and not only take the punishment, but dish it back, he passed his test with flying colors. He absolutely did. Definition of excellent. Not only that, but Hunter grabs a steel chain from a toolbox that's under the ring, and he whips Batista with it. Doesn't whip him with a leather belt, which is a normal hazing tactic if you're a pro wrestler. He whips him with a steel chain. Like, you, you can imagine how much more that hurts. You know, like, <laughs> if you're getting freaking whipped with a steel chain, like, bro, <laughs> like, there's, uh, give Batista massive props for taking those, oh, like, yeah. a fucking man. He was choked several times with the chain over he the tried hanging him. style. He yeah. tried hanging him. It's like, these guys, like, Batista even said in the contract signing, you're going to have to kill me to take this title away from me. Hunter was trying to kill him. Hunter was trying to commit live murder inside this cell. You know, it's... Triple H fire back with, you're going to have to kill me to stop me. Yeah. Yeah. It really did. It was, again, the culmination to this awesome, awesome, awesome feud. And that's what I was saying. This is where Vince's booking actually shined. Because this is probably one of the best book storylines. It is. In his, in the mid-2000s. You know, this feud, the Eddie Guerrero Ray Mysterio feud that's ongoing on SmackDown. You know... I will give the devil his due, literally. This this was some good stuff. Literally, yeah. Uh, Batista thrusts Hunter face first into the cell. The camera is on Batista for at least two minutes, so you know Hunter is blading up a storm. And sure enough, when you see uh, when you see Triple H on camera again, just gushing blood out of his forehead like a garden hose. You know, it's just it looks like a crime scene in there. It really does. You know, like this no. No Hell in a Cell match like has felt this brutal in our retro since Brock and Taker, in my opinion. Like, have it's... you noticed that sometimes WWE will do like a a special presentation replay? I'm not like the whole Cell match, but like some of the Cell match. And notice the minute blood is introduced, it'll go black and white. And yeah, I feel like that's the true shift of like this is a real life horror movie now. <clears throat> and I've shared this memory before. I will never forget watching that Lesnar Taker match and me and my brother and my cousin were literally cuddling together in blankets and the sheer look of horror on my cousin's face as she was watching this match with us. It's just like, there's nothing like hell in a cell, man. No. (laughs) Speaking of, it's time for Triple A to grab this barbed wire steel chair. And this thing looks like a weapon that was made fresh for the walking dead. You know, like this thing looks like it could do some damage nails Dave in the back with it. The crowd starts chanting, holy shit, and they are absolutely right. 
uh, our first fecal chant of the evening, as Joey Styles would say. Uh, and then Batista starts nailing Hunter in the face with this thing and grinding the chair into his face. And I'm like, whose idea was this? A barbed wire steel chair? Like, <laughs> how does yeah, how do they come up with this? this where Batista, the, Triple H does not get enough credit for his selling, but Batista hit a spot on Triple H, and Triple H does, basically does his version of the flare flop, which he totally adopted from Rick. Oh, you know what it was? Oh, this was this was gnarly. Even more gnarly than any of the barbed wire chair spots. So Hunter goes up, he introduces his trusty sledgehammer, because of course he does. He plays a huge part in this story. That was his weapon of choice when he returned after the Gold Rush tournament. He takes this... Well, no, no, no. He wasn't up top of the sledgehammer. He went up top with some sort of weapon. I don't remember off the top, but anyway. It been the chain. I think he wrapped the chain around his fist. That was it. That was it. Thank you. So, yeah, he tries the flying nothing, and Batista, instead of getting his foot up, gets the sledgehammer up, gets it vertical in an upright position so that (sighs) nails Hunter right underneath the chin, and you could, like, Hunter had... Beautifully. Yeah, and he actually spits out some blood like it's uh, <laughs> like it's water during his entrance. It's just like that. Honestly, might be one of the sickest spots that Triple H has ever taken. You know, even um, though they, it might have yeah. been gimmicked in his mouth, but like God, like it made it Great look smile. like a freaking Great like t- it looks like a Tarantino movie in there, man. Like it did. Good um, lord. We get a table set up in the corner. We get steel steps set up. And this was a little silly. I like the spot. It was just a reaction to the spot. Triple H goes for the pedigree on the steel steps. Batista turns it into a spine buster. And JR is like marking out for this spot. He's saying like, of all the stuff I've seen in Hell in a Cell, I have never seen a spine buster on the steel steps. I'm like, is that really the craziest thing you've ever seen, JR? When a spine buster on the steel steps. When I'm sorry, my JR sounded more like Mauro Ronaldo for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, yeah, that, that commentary sounds a bit contrived. Literally, when mankind was thrown off the roof of the cell, literally not even five feet away from JR, seven years prior to this. Like, there's no way a spine buster on the steel steps is the craziest spot. Absolutely yes, no way. That was that looked very painful for Triple H to take, but you are like overselling it like it's the the greatest spot ever. Yeah. Uh crowd marking out huge for a lot of these near falls. Triple H actually does hit the pedigree, which per the story, Batista is supposed to be deathly afraid of. And Batista has overcome this fear. He kicks out of the pedigree finally. Uh, Triple H is beside himself. Uh, Spinebuster on the stairs, as you said. Uh, he goes, so this is actually, I love this finish. I don't I don't care what people say. I don't care if it's forced, but I love it. Yeah, you know what? After thinking about it, it, it this was pretty cool. It did yeah. build up the drama for like, oh shit, is this going to happen or which way is this going to go? It's like a classic Western standoff. Who's quicker to the draw? Batista gets Hunter up for the Batista bomb. Triple H has a sledgehammer in his hand, and he goes up like he's going to hit Batista with it, but too late. Batista hits him with that Batista bomb, and I believe that's the only Batista bomb he hit on Triple H. That's a very protected finisher. Yeah, and I love, you know, I don't want to say it's my favorite power bomb of all time, not when the last ride exists, not when... The last ride! But I don't know what it is. The way Batista just pops his hips for the Batista bomb and the way he rolls out of it before he goes to the pin, it was a perfect finisher for him. Hunter has the sledgehammer in his hands and he's unconscious as Batista pins him one, two, three. It's literally like the result of a Western standoff. Batista was just quicker to the quicker to the gun. And you know, he fired first, he fired quicker and uh, triple H was just a bit like a second too late. That's how you make Hunter look strong in defeat here. This match was excellent. I don't care. I'm giving it five stars. Wow. This this is one of my favorite matches as a kid. And this really just like put it in. Because I talked about this before. As a kid growing up, once we got out of the era of, you know, I I always loved The Undertaker. I loved Kane. I loved uh, Benoit before he did what he did. Shawn Michaels is my favorite of all time. Jericho, Angle, all these great wrestlers. But as a kid in this prime of my childhood, middle school, high school, John Cena and Batista, favorite wrestlers. And this just really solidified that for me. This was Batista's final test as a world champion. Could he do it as a main eventer? He passed with flying colors. 
the drama was there, the spots were great. Um, and this is the beginning and the end of a few things. First of all, spoiler alert, Cena got drafted to Raw, Batista's going to SmackDown. Yes. He's not going to have Triple H on his own. It's finally time to let the bird out of his nest. See if he'll sink or swim on his own. Or yeah. fly or fall. And yes. Batista is but the face again, of SmackDown. Yeah, basically the brand swap world titles. And we will be talking about Batista when we get to the Great American Bash because he's in the main event of that show. Yeah. While it's on my mind, the cover, the SmackDown versus Raw 2006, with Cena in red and Batista in blue, goat cover. Goat yes. Cover. That one of. One of the GOAT games also. Like, that might be another topic for another podcast. So, Moss is talking about our favorite wrestling games and just talking about memories Ooh. there. But, uh, Dust some of those off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you're right. Batista is drafted to SmackDown after this show. And we'll, we'll get into the build with JBL and what have you uh, when we get to the bash. But, yeah, it's kind of the end of an era. It's the end of this feud. And I forgot to rate this match myself. Objectively speaking, I, I think I'll match the five stars. But... But I do not like this match more than the I Quit match from Judgment Day. Like, because I feel like... Really? Yeah, I liked the I Quit match more. Because I feel like... Okay. Yeah. The, here's my thing. I feel like both of those matches are equally great for their own reasons. I think it's just in the matter of which match between the two would I rather rewatch. And I feel like I've wanted to rewatch that I Quit match way more than this one. Um... I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I love this match. I love how brutal it is. It's probably one of, if not the most underrated Hell in a Cell match of all time. Because nobody talks about this match. It's either the original, which is still my favorite Hell in a Cell. You know, that's that's untouchable to me. They obviously talk about Taker and Mankind. They talk about Brock and Taker, both versions. This one is always lost in the shuffle. And I've never understood why. It's in my top five cell matches, too. It's this one mm-hmm. in no particular order. It's this one, Edge and Taker from SummerSlam 08. Oh, that's Lesnar's a great one, too. No Mercy. Oh, I love it. Edge and Taker is my favorite PG Hell in a Cell match. So, yeah. Edge and Taker, Taker Lesnar, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and what was the other one I was thinking of? It's a tie between... Tri- oh, my God. I'm going to have to... You're forgetting about... Game. Forgetting about Taker and Batista at Survivor it's Series good. 07. It's not in my top five, though. Yeah. Uh, I, I, w- I prefer Taker and Triple H from Mania 28. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, just because of the drama, absolutely. But this one this one is certainly up there oh. in terms of the best of the best. Taker and Orton, which we'll be talking about later this year. Oh, in, a, in an Armageddon show that's not as shitty as the one we just had. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, Vengeance. Oh, my opinion it is. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... <laughs> it's a one-match show. Any well, who that is near here or now... We're getting way ahead of the game here. Yeah, but... yeah. this is excellent. Um, But what else was this the end of? The Reign of Terror. Finally. Thank fucking God. It took Wait. us... It took us three years and God knows how many podcasts, but we did it, Tomas. We did it. We got through it. Just to put this... Just to put this into perspective, Triple H isn't going to touch a healthy world title reign for three years. That's right. That's right. And uh, Triple H after the title for literally two hours in 07. But other than that, until 2008, he ain't going to touch that world title. No, no, not even close. He's there to put over the generals and be the cool heel like the Roddy Piper of this era. But um Triple H, at this point in time, this feud with Batista is over. Like, him and Batista are not going to cross paths again for a good while after this. I don't even think... Ooh, 14 yeah. years. 14 years, yeah. Yeah, no, their next singles match was the Mania match, wasn't it? Batista's last match, right? They may have crossed paths here and there. They team up, for sure. But one-on-one, yeah. Yeah. I have to go back and research this is it. Uh, yeah, th- this is it for that feud. And Triple H would go and take some time off. Uh, I read I read online that it was because he had some nagging injuries, and I don't doubt that for a second. But I also think, and the timeline might be adding up, but I think this is around the time where Hunter was w- looking to start a family with Steph. Because if you think about it, the timeline, because the next time you see Steph on TV at WrestleMania, she's pregnant. Like, the timeline adds up. 
No, you know, no, 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 no. She's going to be involved in something later this year. Oh, I don't. I, I'm forgetting. I'm drawing a blank. The weirdest fucking match. I don't want to say it because I am looking so forward. I'll give you a hint. It involves Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, wait. She was involved in that? Yes, oh, she was. man. Yes, just... she was. And you know why I know that? Whoosh. I was at the Monday Night Raw, the very first Monday Night Raw, where Not... she came out to Stone Cold Music and fucking trolled all of us. Oh, man. I must have forgotten all about that. But, hey, we'll, we'll get to that to when we get it. to that. I but can't wait to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, yeah, Batista and Triple H had a fan fucking tastic main event to cap off what a lot of people consider to be in the top three shows of 2005. This is definitely a well-paced show. The, the top three matches are well worth admission, but the undercard leaves a little bit more to be desired. But when you have more than one match that's over four and a half stars, one of them reaching five in both of our cases, I think that's enough to give this an eight, maybe an 8.25 out of 10. Like, I'm going to give it a 7.5 because I'm looking at the show really. Even though the latter half of the card is excellent, okay, the undercard is just, it's there. I feel like, I know you have to have more matches that pad out the pay-per-view. Um, I had a lot of fun with the triple threat match. I love Michaels and Angles. I love the Hell in a Cell match. But a more well-rounded undercard would have been nice, too. Yeah, um, but I, I see what you're like saying. If I gave it an 8.5, I just feel like, damn, I really enjoy it that much, though. Oh, I did. I think the last three matches are well worth the price of admission, and it kind of makes you forget about the undercard a little bit. I didn't mind Carlito and Shelton as much. Um, Kane versus Edge was it, it was it's better than some of their other matches we've talked about. It's, but yeah, I feel weird comparing it to a, a show that's not going to happen for another seven years. But speaking of Mania Twenty Eight, it kind of reminds me of Mania Twenty Eight, or Mania Twenty Eight reminds me of this show. It's like you look at the undercard for that one. Uh, Sheamus and Daniel saying Cody Rhodes, Big Show, Orton Kane. Nobody cares about those matches. But once it gets kicked into high gear with Triple H and Taker and Punk and Jericho and uh, uh, Cena Rock, it's like that's the path of the card people remember. Yeah, yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. But I enjoyed this, man. I don't know if I like it as much as Judgment Day. I definitely don't like it as much as Mania or ECW One Night Stand, but... I think it's certainly up there. 2005 has been a very strong year of uh, shows so far. Royal Rumble was a great show. But now our next retrospective podcast is probably the worst 2005 has to offer, the Great American Bash, which Batista is headlining because he does move over to SmackDown. And we also get the culmination of the draft lottery. The rosters are set. And we'll uh, we'll cover that in a bit more detail when we get there. And it's um, also... Let's just say... SmackDown doesn't get totally fucked over like they did last year, but it's a rocky start with the booking. Yeah, yeah, and we'll. Uh, <laughs> it's the end of uh, it's the end of a couple of things on this show. One of which is a character that we have lauded and praised a lot, but you know, certain mistakes we'll were there. made. Yeah. Certain mistakes we'll, were made, and we'll get we'll yeah. cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah, we'll open that big, gigantic can of snakes and cobras when we get there. But uh, hit that subscribe button if you're new. Tap that thumbs up as well. Uh, Tomas and I are here talking wrestling all the time. Great American Bash podcast is coming up, of course. We will be reviewing AEW World's End, but I will be asking you guys to uh, be patient with us for that review because it is going to be a very busy holiday season, oh, as yeah, I'm sure absolutely. is... As I'm sure is the case Thanks, with Tony everybody Khan. watching. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Tony. Thanks, Tony Khan, for booking a pay-per-view the day before New Year's Eve. Thanks, Tony Khan. While WWE is doing absolutely nothing, anywho, beside that, we will be looking at AEW World and we will be looking at Great American Bash. If we maybe might, don't, don't quote us on this, have some free time. Maybe we can squeak something out if there's time, but... uh. Look forward to those. That's going to be our next projects. Yeah, yeah. I can't guarantee anything, but next WWE pay-per-view is the Royal Rumble. Um, there are a few ideas that are being bounced around about possibly maybe even doing a retro Royal Rumble in the hype. But, I mean, again, don't quote us on this. We're just, yeah, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But, guys, thank you so much. Uh, let us know what you thought of Vengeance 05 down in the comments as well. And, uh, yeah, take care, guys.